So for this, uh, this session, I want to ask you this question. Are your attempts to communicate hurting or helping your marriage? Uh, we all know, or at least we should know, uh, that when we come to a red light, a stoplight, what we should do. Uh, when it's red, we stop. When it's green, we go. When it's yellow, we go faster, right? Uh, just kidding. Uh, but I want to use this analogy tonight to evaluate our communication. And by doing this, there's three things that we can do. Uh, there are, when we, when we think red uh, in our communication, there are things that we need to stop doing with our communication. Uh, for example, yelling at your spouse, calling hurtful names, or being harsh and critical. Uh, and we should know these things, right? Uh, so because we should know these things, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time tonight on these red stop stop it kind of issues. Uh, we're going to talk about some, some yellow things, some, some, some reasons or ways that we need to make a quick decision uh, whether we need to slow down and stop or if we can proceed with caution or, uh, through the yellow light. Uh, and then there are some green light things that we're going to talk about that we should go or keep going. Uh, and so to get started, first thing, I want to talk about some yellow, -like, yellow light cautions. Uh, you know, the Bible has a lot to say about the things that we talk about, how we communicate. Uh, Russell has, has pointed out some, some of them already, and we're going to look uh, at a few others that the Bible has to say. Um, in James chapter 3, uh, gives, uh, James gives a lot of really strong uh, information about the danger of the tongue. Uh, he says that we have a lot of trouble with our tongue. It's in James 3 that he sa it says that the tongue is hard to control. Uh, that uh, if you are able to control your tongue, James says, uh, then you are a perfect, uh, some translations say, or mature person. You, you have really grown to spiritual maturity if you're able to uh, control your tongue. Uh, and you, you have no doubt, I have no doubt that uh, those of you who are here who know what marriage is, uh, you know that marriage is going to produce a lot of opportunities for us to stumble in what we say. Uh, and so we, we say wrong things. Sometimes we say wrong things intentionally. Uh, we see it's a red light and we run it anyhow, right? So, but we need to stop. Uh, and sometimes it's unintentional. We don't, we don't, we didn't have time to really think about it. We didn't really uh, think about how it would come across, and it ends up being something that ends up being hurtful. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to look at what are some ways that we might keep from stumbling in what we say. And so there, there are some things that have the potential to hurt our communication, and we should exercise caution. And so these first things are what I'm, I'm calling yellow light cautions. You, you see, this should be like a warning to you. This should be a reminder to you to check yourself and see if you should stop or see if you should keep going. Are you following me? Uh, so um, here, here we are. Uh, we've, got, we've got some different things that I want us to consider. And the first yellow light caution that I want us to talk about tonight is this, is that we need to make sure that our attitude is right. Uh, and we need to acknowledge right up front that, that we know, you know that you have a bad attitude before you say anything, right? Like if you, if you have the awareness of self, the presence of mind to know, hey, I'm really in a bad mood, that should give you reason to pause. That should give you reason to, to pause before you say anything. Uh, Russell read from Matthew 12, 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, we need to acknowledge right up front that we, we have things going on in our heart uh, that are going to come out of our mouth. And, and if we can uh, have the awareness of what's going on in our heart, then maybe it won't come out of our mouth. And so we need to make sure that our attitude is right. Um, 
that we, we can keep ourselves maybe from stumbling in what we say, say uh, by having awareness uh, of these things. Uh, we need to be careful. Uh, the, there are many helpful warnings in the Scripture about what we say. Uh, I want you, if you have a Bible, to uh, turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 18. Uh, we're going to look at several verses in Proverbs 18 that, uh, uh, that tell us about our speech. Uh, just a little bit of uh, background about the book of Proverbs is written by Solomon, uh, who has this, uh, this interesting fact, this superlative about him, uh, that Solomon is the, the wise man, right? That he is uh, probably the wisest man who has ever lived. Uh, Solomon was one, uh, a person who spent his life in pursuit of understanding, of, of wisdom. Uh, and he, he gathered wisdom, he collected wisdom, he wrote uh, sayings of wisdom, uh, and that's what the book of Proverbs is, is, is Solomon's wisdom that he wrote down, uh, that he found during, during the course of his life, that God had showed to him through different ways. Uh, and uh, one of the things he does when he writes Proverbs in his search for wisdom is that he writes a lot about foolishness. So uh, if we think of this, uh, this kind of spectrum, uh, that on one side we have wise things, godly things, helpful things, uh, he writes about these sayings of wisdom. But then he also points out the foolish things, fo things that are hurtful and things that are uh, not unwise and things that can be uh, harmful to us. And so when Solomon writes Proverbs, it's really about the pursuit of wisdom and the avoidance of foolishness. And so he writes uh, on this continuum between wisdom and foolishness. Uh, and one of the first things we need to do, if we're going to make sure our attitude is right, uh, we need to be to on the watch, or watch out for a foolish heart. That we need to be, be, be careful about having a foolish heart. Uh, Proverbs 18, verse 2, it says this, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his own opinion. Uh, that what, what is the, the heart thing that's going on here? What is happening? What is the foolish thing? Solomon says that it's a person who doesn't want to hear or understand another person, but who only wants to say what's on their mind and what's on their heart. This is somebody who is not going to give you the opportunity to talk. Russell talked about interrupting. Uh, they're going to stop you, and they're going to make sure that they just keep on talking. Uh, they, they're not interested in what you think. They only want to say their opinion. I, I heard this joke years ago, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense, that you know people don't want to hear our opinion. They want to hear their, our opinion coming out, or their opinion coming out of our mouth, right? Uh, so uh, Solomon says that it's foolish, foolishness, that when we uh, only want to express ourselves, we find pleasure uh, in expressing our own opinion. Uh, if we uh, think ourselves to be in the right and everybody else in the wrong and we never want to listen to anybody else, uh, that's foolish. Uh, Solomon talks more about having a foolish heart. Uh, verses 6 and 7. Chapter 18, he says, A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth is, is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul. Uh, how many of you uh, have, have been in a situation where you said uh, the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong person and came to regret it? Uh, that you uh, smarted off to your parents and, and there was punishment to, uh, uh, to follow or you, you said the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time and, and, and they decided to, to take aggressive action against you. Uh, Solomon says that the way we talk, excuse me, the way we talk is going to have some influence in this. A fool's lips walk into a fight and his mouth invites a beating. Now, if we're, we're kind of applying this to communication, you know, there's a lot of things that we're going to say 
uh, that are foolish things, that are, that are harmful things, that when we say to somebody else, it is going to invite a fight. And by that, I mean an argument, a, 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 a sharp disagreement. And we need to be on the watch uh, out for a foolish heart. Uh, we also need to be on the watch. We need to watch out for a bitter heart. Uh, when uh, the Bible talks about uh, what it is for a husband to love their wives, uh, Ephesians chapter 5 says that husbands should love their wives as Christ loves the church. Uh, there's a parallel passage in the book of Colossians, our church. We just finished going through Colossians, and uh, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about God's instruction to husbands. In Colossians uh, 3.19, uh, it says the same thing. Husbands, love your wives. Uh, but in Ephesians, there is a positive example given. Uh, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up uh, for her. In Colossians, however, there is not a positive statement, there's a negative statement. Colossians says, husbands, love your wives uh, and do not be harsh with them. Uh, that uh, this, uh, this word, harsh, uh, really is, uh, is, is bitterness. Uh, Paul is saying in Colossians, love does not look like this. Love does not talk like this. Uh, this is a negative definition of love, one commentary says. Uh, King James, New American Standard in, in uh, Colossians, uh, is translated bitter. Do not be bitter with your wife. Uh, and unfortunately, what uh, I believe the Scripture is addressing is a common problem for men, that since the Garden of Eden, uh, that men are motivated by a harsh bitterness uh, that makes them communicate with their wife in a way that condemns and criticizes, that hurts and humiliates our wives. And we need to be careful about this, how this attitude affects our action. We need to watch out for a bitter heart. Uh, we need to watch out for an angry heart. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 is, a, is another place in the Scripture where it really talks about communication. Uh, and it has some, some, some things to say. If you have your Bible, so let's flip over to Ephesians chapter 4 and let's read what it has to say. Because uh, uh, it's, it's helpful. Verses 26 and 27. It says, Be angry and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Uh, let's just keep on reading down through verse 29. Uh, let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Uh, in these uh, verses in Ephesians, Paul is having us think this idea that out of an angry heart uh, comes corrupt communication. Our words can become weapons. Uh, specifically mentioned in the passage are lying, gossip, and slander, uh, that, that it talks about things that we don't need to do. Uh, and Paul ends up saying, he says, we need to build up with our words and not beat up with our words, right? Uh, and so uh, we need to make sure, a caution that we should build into our life is that we should make sure that our attitude is right. Uh, before I go on to these next two yellow light cautions, I want to kind of set up uh, this with an example, an illustration, and I, I hope you'll, you'll follow me. Uh, my wife is a teacher, and I want to use this illustration that, that it, 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 it finds uh, uh, kind of ba its basis in, in a classroom. Uh, my, my wife, as a teacher, she uh, uh, teaches writing sometimes, and, and one of the things she does when she teaches writing is to give a writing prompt. Y'all know what that is? Uh, so a writing prompt, a, a teacher will say, okay, I want you to write a story, and uh, they'll give a few facts. They say, they'll give you a few details that, you, that they want to include in the story, but then they'll give the freedom to every kid to write the story as they want, okay? 
Now, what happens when the teacher gives a few facts and then the, te- the kids are able to, to write a story however they want? They end up with a very different, a whole lot of different kinds of stories, right? Uh, they, they can come up with some very uh, different, very creative stories. Uh, and uh, in this, um, uh, it really illustrates uh, something that you do that I don't even know if you're aware that you do. Did you know that you, when you have, are given a few facts, you start writing a story in your mind? And before you know it, you, you have uh, fleshed out a whole story from a, a handful of details. I want you to think about this. Have you, do you do this? Do you uh, do this in real life situations? And uh, I, I would tell you, I can come up with a story in my head about things very quickly. I can uh, take an, a quick assessment, gather a few details around me, and I can feel like I have an understanding of what is going on. Uh, and I have written a story about my understanding of the situation. Uh, and uh, I, honestly, you know, I, I find that uh, in, in my story writing, in my uh, um, rush to uh, fill out the, the meat of this story, I don't always uh, I understand what's going on. And I, I experienced this with my wife, Joy, uh, and I'm shocked how often that uh, this happens, that, that I, will, I will start to react on a, a little bit of information that I have added to in a wrong way, and I don't really understand the situation. Uh, any of y'all ever do that? Uh, you don't have to raise your hands. So I, it's just me, probably. Uh, but after 23 years of marriage, I'm still shocked how often I find myself um, just taking a few details that I have augmented in my mind and come up with a story that's completely different than what my wife has in mind. And so I, I want you to follow me with this. This really sets up my next two points about the, avoiding these pitfalls or the yellow light cautions that we um, need to, to, to slow down and stop before we get into bad, a bad situation. Uh, and so having this in mind, the tendency of us to, to take a few, few details and to fill in gaps in, in the details with our own imagination or our own understanding of the story, um, that we come up with something different. Uh, the, the, next, uh, the next yellow light caution, I would say, is that you need to have, you need to make sure that you have adequate information. Adequate information. Uh, in the illustration I just used, it points to the, this fact, uh, this, this idea that, that our facts are always incomplete information. You and your spouse, you, you uh, think you know, each other, you know each other, you think you know each other real well, but, but there are things that come up that, that you don't have all the information on, Right? And you begin to, to build up a story, and you maybe begin to, uh, to react uh, uh, in that, that situation to the story that you are playing in your mind. Uh, and one of the things that we need to develop the habit of doing is making sure we get more information before we get too carried away with the story that's in our head. Uh, are you following me with this? Um, we should get in the habit of asking more questions and getting more information. And now I will say that we will never know it all, but you can have enough information to have a good conversation. Uh, if you are thinking, if we're thinking about our analogy of driving, uh, you know, you really should not be out on the road driving if you do not understand the rules of the road. If you don't understand the stop, the stoplight, the red, yellow, and green light, if you don't understand the speed limit sign or the yield sign or that you should be driving on the right side of the road and not the left side of the road, if you're ignorant of these things, you realize that, that it's dangerous. But in our communication, we are often ignorant of things that are going on that, that cause harm and do harm uh, in our relationships. Uh, so if you, uh, if you are ignorant, you should not operate a car, but you also should not try to communicate uh, based on faulty, inco- or incomplete information. 
Uh, again, Proverbs points to this idea. Uh, in Proverbs 18.2, two, it says, A fool does not get understanding. <clears throat> so, uh, the, the fool just wants to rush ahead with what he, he thinks. Uh, he doesn't want to take the time to hear from other people. Um, Proverbs uh, 4, uh, Solomon is writing to, he's talking to his sons. Uh, he's encouraging his sons. And in Proverbs 4, 7, he, he tells them uh, that, that they should get wisdom. They should get insight. That what, uh, whatever they do, they should get wisdom. Uh, so he presents this idea that it's wise to try and learn, try and get more understanding from other people. Uh, he says this uh, in verse 13 uh, of Proverbs chapter 18. He says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and his shame. So do you find yourself speaking about things before you've really uh, heard all the information that is out there? Uh, do, you, do you want to, to express your opinion before uh, you, you've really given other people a chance to, to give um, their in part of the story? Solomon says this is folly and this is shame. Proverbs 18, verse 15 says this, An intelligent heart acquires wisdom, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. Uh, so uh, what should that do for us when we're thinking about the information that we have? If uh, we, we're trying to build this habit of getting more information uh, rather than going on uh, ignorance, uh, we should get information, we should uh, uh, try and uh, acquire knowledge, get the, get the information that we need. And so what I would say to us is this, that we should always be asking questions rather than making assumptions. Uh, if you are reacting on a limited amount of data, a few little details, uh, and you are filling in the, the cracks with your own imagination, you're making an assumption of what the other person means. You're making an assumption of what the other person is talking about. Uh, and uh, this is not a good idea. You re we really need to ask questions of them to make sure that we're understanding what they are saying. So not only do we need to, to get more information in order to have adequate information, uh, we need to make sure that we have accurate information. So asking questions to make sure that we have all of the details or enough of the details that we need is an important part of communication. Um, and that it's harmful for us if we, if we uh, don't get that information. But what about this when we uh, not only have incomplete information, uh, but we fill in the details with incorrect information? Uh, so if we uh, begin to build this story up in our minds and we are not really thinking about or focused on the truth, uh, it is going to be a problem. Uh, we uh, fill the voids uh, in our, uh, our conversation, our communication with our own interpretation uh, of what we believe to be right or what we think the other person is meaning or saying. And uh, we build up an idea uh, in our minds. And this is where Proverbs eighteen seventeen is helpful to us. So Proverbs 18, 17 says, The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Now, what I want you to have in mind as you're thinking about this uh, verse is really a courtroom. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever had to go to court or be in court uh, for anything, but uh, uh, in a, a criminal case, at least how it is on Matlock, you know, the, the lawyer gets up and, right, he makes his opening uh, statements, right? Uh, and the lawyer, he, he, will, he will present uh, uh, his, uh, like if he's the defense attorney, he'll present, you know, what an what a upright citizen and what a good guy and how he's uh, done all this. And, and, and you hear the opening statements and you think, well, this guy can't be guilty. He must, he must you know, it, we've got to find him uh, not guilty, uh, but then the other attorney stands up and, and makes a case uh, for the prosecution, right? Y'all are familiar with this. 
uh, and they, they bring up, uh, you know, character witnesses, and they bring up these things, and they bring up all these other things, and then you're like, well, okay, maybe, maybe not. Uh, and so it's, Proverbs is using this language to, to help us think that the first person to, to present their argument seems right. And here's what I want you to, to follow me with, okay? Uh, in your mind, you're the first person. You, you, you have, you, you have uh, come up with the argument in your mind, but have you really been cross-examined or have you heard the other side of the story? Uh, the old adage, there's, there's two sides to every story. Uh, but are you only telling yourself your version or are you hearing the other side of the story? And Proverbs is saying that the first person to go seems right until you hear the other side of the story. And so we need to offer, allow ourselves to be corrected. Where our story gets wrong, where we have wrong ideas, uh, we need to allow that to be challenged. We need to allow that to be changed. Uh, so we, we've, got to, we've got to do that. Uh, and so how? How do, we, how do we do that? Uh, so I'm going to get to that more in a minute. Uh, I want us to kind of make the transition from more of the yellow light cautions uh, to the green light situations that the Scripture presents uh, about how we communicate that are going to not hurt our communication but help our communication. And I just want to give credit right up front that uh, a lot of this uh, in the, the green light uh, situations uh, comes uh, from uh, an, an adaptation of, of what is called the four rules of communication that I heard about uh, when I went to the Biblical Counseling Training Conference in Lafayette, Indiana at Faith Baptist Church. Uh, you can look that up online. <coughs> the Four Rules of Communication, Steve Viers, uh, has a, a, a sermon manuscript, basically, that he has that's available. You can go and read that, and I just want to acknowledge right up front that a lot of what I'm going to say is kind of uh, an adaptation and an addition to, to some of those ideas. Uh, but if you ever get a chance to hear that uh, audio, video, uh, you should do it, and, and uh, it's good stuff. Uh, but here are some green light situations that I want you to consider. Uh, first of all, you need to make sure that you are hearing your spouse. Uh, Mike, this will maybe go to your question about you know listening and how how does that uh, how, how does that apply? You need to hear your spouse, and I want to present a couple of scenarios that to to help us think through what does it mean to hear. Uh, there, there are a few places in the Scripture where the Bible talks about hearing uh, in different ways. Uh, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus was teaching in parables. Uh, and he was talking to his disciples, and he makes this point that not everybody who heard the parables was really going to understand the point of what Jesus was saying. And so the disciples were asking Jesus about it. What does this mean? And Jesus says to the disciples, he says, to you, it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom. He said, but there are people who are going to hear this that I'm saying, and they're not going to understand what I'm teaching. Okay, so there is this sense that the scripture talks about the ability to hear without understanding. Okay? And this happens in our conversation with our spouse, right? Like we are talking, we are using the same words, we're talking about the same subject, uh, but for some reason we are missing each other. We are like, we're, we're, you know, I'm here, she's here, something is not connecting, Right? And Jesus is, is using intelligible language, using words, using a picture to teach a truth that people are not getting the point to. Uh, and uh, we, we need to, to understand that. We need to, to hear with understanding. We need to, to understand the meaning of the message. Uh, James chapter 1 also talks about hearing the Word of God. 
Uh, Russell, again, quoted this uh, earlier. It says, uh, in relation to, to hearing the Word of God, be quick to hear and slow to speak. Uh, but James talks about hearing the Word of God, but he adds something to it, that it's not enough to just hear the Word of God, but what? To do what it says. So, so the Scripture also talks about this idea that we might hear something, but it's really of no benefit if we don't do it. And so here are two situations that the Scripture talks about, uh, about hearing and it not being beneficial. One more example in the Scripture. Uh, Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22. The Apostle Paul talks about um, the... Um, the time when he came to know the Lord, when he was converted on the road to Damascus. Uh, and in Acts chapter 9, uh, he is giving the, the scenario, and, and your Bible will say uh, that Paul was traveling with some other people. And, and in Acts chapter 9, uh, it says that, that they heard a voice. And then you go to Acts chapter 22, and in the King James uh, Version, uh, Acts chapter 22, verse 9. Uh, so 9, 7 says they were hearing a voice, but then Acts 22, 9 in the King James says they heard not the voice. Is that, does that mean that there's a contradiction in the Bible? And of course, I, I think we would all agree, No. Uh, the English Standard Version, New American Standard, New NIV, uh, they both clarify the count. Uh, the account in, in ESV, New American Standard, NIV, in Acts chapter 22, verse 9, uh, it says, they did not understand. They did not understand. And I, I, I believe that to be that they, they heard something, but they did not understand intelligible words. They, they heard something, but they did not know what. They, they were not able to understand. And so I want to ask you two questions tonight uh, that, that would relate to how we hear the Word of God or how we would even hear our wife or our husband or our coworker. Uh, do you hear and understand the meaning? So when they are talking, are, are you getting the point of what they're trying to get across? Uh, or are they just are, are, are you missing something that they're saying? There, there's no mystery in their, their language. They're using words that you know. They're using concepts that you're familiar with. But for some reason, you are not coming to the same understanding that they are. You, do you hear with understanding? Or maybe uh, you, you hear the words, but you can't actually tell what they're saying. Now, i got to confess, I'm guilty of this one. That my wife can be talking... And I can be saying, uh-huh, nodding my head, but I'm, I'm actually like looking at my phone or reading, uh-huh, yeah. And then she asked me a question. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> can you repeat everything you just said, <laughs> right? So, so it's like I hear the words. I mean, I know she's talking, but I, I'm not actually hearing her. Uh, any of y'all ever watch Charlie Brown? You know, Charlie Brown, he's talking normally, you understand, and then when the teacher comes on, it's more like wah, 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 right? So, uh, in this, there, there, there's two situations. Are we, we hearing and understand the meaning, or, or are we actually hearing the words, or, or is it just they're talking? And so, here is a practical application that I would like to encourage you uh, to try. When you are talking with your spouse, I want you to check with them uh, and see how much you are getting from their communication with you. Okay? Uh, so option one is this. Can you repeat back to them what they have said word for word? Do you ever just say, all right, here, here's what I heard from you, and you try and repeat it as closely as you can 
what they said to you. Uh, now, this is going to show that you were listening and you're trying to understand and that you, you've heard the words that they were saying. Or, or do you get close? I mean, you may not get it, you know, the word order exactly right, but, but are you able to repeat back to them what they, they were saying? Were you really listening? Are you hearing the words they're saying? But here's option two, and this is one that's maybe a little more challenging for us to consider. Uh, will you take what you think they are saying and put it in your own words and repeat it back to them? Now, what is going to happen when you do this, when you take what you think they've said and put it in your own words and repeat it back to them, you are going to give them the opportunity to say, no, that's not exactly what I was saying. Uh, that you, you have not really heard, or maybe I have not communicated what I have really meant. And by doing this practical exercise, you are going to be able to work on sharpening your understanding uh, of each other. And so I really want to encourage you to try this exercise. The next time you are, uh, you are having a, a conversation about something, or maybe you're uh, really having difficulty understanding each other, are you able to repeat the other person's words back to them? Are you listening to what they say? Uh, and can you put it in your own words and speak it to them and see if, if there's a, a mix-up in how, how you are interpreting their conversation? And so that is going to be a, a practical help for you to, to make sure that you are really hearing with understanding what your spouse is saying. You know, I really wish my kids would hear with understanding a lot of times. Uh, let me give you a situation, maybe you understand this. Uh, I say to them, your shoes are in the living room. Okay, what do I mean? Go get your shoes and put them in your bedroom, right? I, I, I say something and they should know what I've said, right? Because I've told them enough times, don't leave your stuff in the living room. You know, so, so here, here's another example, right? Uh, all right, so um, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, some more how, how we can make sure we uh, are having good conversations. We need to make sure we're hearing our spouse. Uh, we need to make sure that we are honest with our spouse. Uh, back over in Ephesians chapter 4, if you, if you have your Bible there, still good. Uh, if not, and you want to flip back over there, we're going to look at uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4 just a little bit more. Uh, Ephesians 4, uh, I want to read verse 15 and verse 25. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, it says this, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. Uh, this verse uh, was given to us uh, to, to help us to understand when we communicate how we should go about doing that. And it says we should speak, first of all. Uh, did you know you must speak to your spouse? Uh, this, uh, this actually is a command. It says speak the truth. Uh, that, uh, you know, when you get upset, when you get bothered, uh, that uh, you clamming up, and having the cold shoulder is not the right option. It is not a Christian response to what is going on. Uh, the Bible says that you must speak. Uh, this, it's a command in Scripture. This, this would be equivalent in, in my mind. Uh, somebody sitting in front of you at the light. The light is turned green and they're sitting there. And what do you do? You're on the horn. Right? You're, you're maybe trying to tell them, it's not going to get any greener, let's go. Right? Uh, so you, you, you get in a situation, you really need to speak. Now, I, I will say this uh, about my wife. She is maybe the least confrontational person in the world. And uh, this is a challenge for her to say something to somebody when, when it's uh, uh, maybe hard to hear. But we don't always have the option to just not say anything. We, we need to speak up. Of course, there are people on the other end of that that, man, they're looking for any and every opportunity they have to tell you just how it is. Right? Well, I'm just telling the truth. Right? 
Uh, but there, there's another qualification in this passage of Scripture. We do need to speak, uh, but we need to speak the truth. Uh, that we speak the truth in love. Uh, verse 25, it, it says, Therefore, putting away falseness, falsehood, and let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Uh, again, we need to speak the truth. We need to not tell lies and not say things that are wrong, but we need to, to speak the truth. Uh, and that we need to speak the truth in love. That we, the way we communicate that is going to have something to, to do with how the conversation goes over. So uh, we really need to be honest. Need to be honest with your spouse that you speak true things in love to them. Uh, that might be a matter of encouragement. That might be a matter of correction. That might be a matter of rebuke. You know, how, how, you know how, do we, how do we deal with differences that are in our relationship? Uh, you know, that in, in every situation is individual and each thing has got to be considered on its own. But there are times to, to encourage and there are times to hold up uh, the weakness that is in somebody else. But then there's a time for correction, gentle and loving, and there's a time for rebuke and we need to... Uh, to be careful uh, that we try and do that. Uh, another, and one more thing, another thing that we need to do, we need to make sure that we are healing from our conflicts. Verses 26 and verse 27. Uh, the scripture says, Be angry and do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Uh, so, uh, let's say you, you've had a, a, an argument, a conflict with your spouse. And we're, again, we're, like Russell said, we're going to talk a little more about that in the morning, uh, talk about conflict. But uh, what happens after the blow-up? What happens after the argument? What happens after the harsh criticism? What ha- happens after the uncaring response? Uh, we need to make sure that we are bringing healing to our relationship. And uh, so Paul writes here, he says uh, that we need to uh, heal from that. And the first thing he says would be to examine your anger. Uh, when you were angry about what happened, uh, is it righteous or unrighteous? Uh, he says, uh, do, uh, be angry, but do not sin. Russell made an allusion to this. Uh, you know, are we righteous in our anger? Uh, that we talk about sinful anger, and people are quick to run to this, bi- this verse and say, well, the Bible says that you can be angry and without sin. But I want to ask you to think about this. Ask yourself, am I angry in the right way, at the right time, with the right person, to the right degree, and for the right reason? And the answer to that is almost always no. We need to examine our anger. Uh, it, it, there is a possibility that you could be angry in the right way, at the right time, with the right person, in the right degree, and for the right purpose. But that is not the normal. Not the normal. Examine your anger. And then he says you need to engage it quickly. Uh, when you get angry, when there's a situation that comes up, you need to do your very best to deal with it quickly. And this is going to allow you to communicate more clearly uh, and by, by doing this. And don't let it sit. Don't, don't let it fester. Uh, that, uh, he says don't let the sun go down on your anger. And I guess we, we have an interpretive question that we need to ask here. Uh, so, is this a hard and a fast rule that, you know, hey, it's uh, 549 and sundown is at 601. We need, to, we need to really get on this because we don't have much time, you know. Uh, is, is that what Scripture is saying or is Paul really trying to help us to see the urgency of dealing with it? You know, if, uh, if you need some time to, to think about what's going on, if you're a more present of mind in the morning to, to address this, as Paul saying, you know, it's not a good idea to maybe come back and talk about it tomorrow uh, when you have gathered your, yourself together and you're able to talk about it a little more. I, I believe that there, there might be some wisdom in finding that time, like Russell was talking about, that, that you are going to commit to this. Uh, that, that, but the point is, is that you do it quickly. You, you don't let uh, the grass grow. 
Uh, and and I really believe this is tied to the idea of your anger turning into bitterness, allowing that anger to sit in your heart until it starts to poison uh, the way you look at things. So uh, make sure that you're healing from your conflicts. Uh, Make sure you're getting to the heart of problems and that you don't hurt people. Uh, Russell mentioned this, so I'm not going to spend a lot more time, but we focus on the problem, not on the person. Uh, If you will think about it this way, you and your spouse are a team and you are working on a specific issue. And if you get off of being a team and you become enemies against each other, you're, you're not making progress. Uh, you, you are a team working against, uh, working on an, an issue, working against an enemy. There is an enemy who uh, is involved in this, and we're going to talk again more th- about this tomorrow during our session on conflict. Uh, get to the heart of the problem that we need to we need to address the specific issue that is going on. And then the last thing I have uh, tonight is this: is that we need to make sure that we take the holy high road. Uh, Ephesians 4, 30 and 31, it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by which you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Uh, three things to take the holy high road. Uh, the first thing that you've got to commit to do is to please God no matter what anybody else does. So it says here that, uh, that you should not grieve the Holy Spirit, uh, that uh, the, the Holy Spirit is given to us to lead us into righteousness and to teach us truth, and that when we do things that are contrary to the Spirit, it grieves Him. Uh, we need to please God. Our, our highest goal uh, is uh, to, to give honor and glory to God. Paul writes about this several other places. Uh, where he says, whether we eat or drink, we should do all for the glory of God. He says in 2 Corinthians, whether we live or die, we should make it our aim to please Him. So in our communication with our spouse, in a, in a conflict that we're in with somebody else, uh, we need to take the holy high road. We need to, uh, to try and please God. It gives some specific ways that we do that, uh, that we please God by putting away sinful attitudes and actions. Verse 31, again, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. These are things that we've got to make sure that we're trying to get rid of. We're trying to uh, remove from our life. And did you notice some of those things are directly related to our communication? Uh, How we talk to other people. We need to get rid of those things. Stop doing those things. uh, That that we've got to put those things away in order to have uh, good, right communication. And then uh, the last thing is pass on to others what God has given to you. Paul says that, that you should be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you, uh, that we have received God's kindness. Romans tells us that it's, it's God's kindness to us, that He doesn't just pour out His wrath on us whenever we sin, that He allows us to come to repentance. We are a we benefit, we receive the, the blessing of kindness. And now Paul says we need to give kindness to, to one another. We need to be tenderhearted and forgiving uh, to, to other people. Why do you forgive people? Is it because they deserve to be forgiven? No. The, our motive for forgiving is not because of the actions that they have done, but it's because of what God has done for us. You know what? God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. When you turn to Him in faith and you confess your sins and you repent of sins and you are saved, the the Bible says that that your sins are cleansed. They're taken away. They're atoned for. uh, And that you no longer bear the weight and the guilt of those sins. And so one of the reasons that when someone sins against us, we are able to forgive them is because of what God has done for us already, that we, we need to forgive them because God has forgiven us. And so Ephesians chapter 4 has some, some helpful ideas, some green light situations that we need to 
pursue on or, or pers- uh, push on in, in communication to make sure that we are helping our marriage and not hurting our marriage. Uh, so we, we, uh, I'll take a few questions if anybody has a question about anything uh, I've said. Well, we will be back here. Uh, the what was your second point, undertaking the holy high road? Undertaking the holy high road is put away. Hold on, folded my notes up. Put it. So, undertaking the holy high road... Yeah, put away sinful attitudes and actions, and then pass on to others what God has given to you. All right. Well, we will be back here in the morning. I hope you'll be able to come and join us in the morning. We're going to talk about conflict. Uh, Conflict is something that uh, every one of us deals with in one way or another. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that. We will have a continental breakfast to start at about 9 o'clock. We've got some uh, uh, fruit and bagels. We'll have uh, coffee and milk and orange juice, uh, some donuts. Uh, come, enjoy a time of fellowship. That'll start about 9 o'clock, and then we'll plan on kicking off about 9.30. Uh, any other comments or questions before we finish up tonight? If not, let's go to the Lord and word of prayer as we uh, close out. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity we've had to study your word together tonight. God, I pray that you would help us to take these truths uh, and put them into practice in our life. God, I pray that you would forgive us where we fail you and fall short. God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to gain control over our tongues. Lord, that we would speak things that are helpful and not hurtful, uh, Lord, to the people that are closest to us. Lord, we thank you again in everything uh, tonight. In Jesus' name.